Welcome to the latest video from Back of the Net, the AFC Bournemouth podcast. Today we are joined by one of the legends of the 80s, Tommy Heffernan. A marauding fullback with a licence to score, a man whose tackles made the whole crowd wince, and a man who was in the supporters club after every game getting a round in for the fans. The last fullback to score double figures in a league season, and a man who loved our club so much, he joined it twice making 217 appearances and scoring 27 times. Part of two promotion sides here in Bournemouth and another promotion with Sheffield United, life with Tommy was never dull. And we know tonight won't be either. But soon Bournemouth's troubles increased when Tom Heffernan found himself sent off for that tackle. He'd been booked earlier in the match and now despite Barnes trying to dissuade the Yorkshire referee, the fullback was off. It hadn't looked a bad enough tackle though for a second booking perhaps. So we are delighted to have with us Tommy Heffernan. Tommy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Nice to uh, be on the show. And you're joining from Ireland, I believe. Is that right? Uh, Dublin, yeah. We're back in Dublin now, 20-odd 20, 20 years. Very good, very good. We've also got uh, a, a fan who's as, about as old as I am to remember some of these games. Neil, how are you doing? I'm younger than you, Jeff, and I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, I do have many happy childhood memories of watching Tommy Heffernan marauding up and down the wing. Thank you. Very Don't we much. both? Don't we both? So we're going to kick off, Tommy, by asking us to uh, ask it if you can cast your mind back to your childhood. Who did you support, and how did you first start playing football? I played. Um, I supported a man new, but I played an Irish game called hurling first. I was, I wasn't into football, and. Uh, just by chance, uh, one Sunday, the football team was short and asked me to play. And uh, it just spiralled from there. I played, uh, I was playing for Dublin hurling side, played in Crow Park a few times. And that was my first sport, hurling. So it was just by accident I, I played football, really. That was the same with uh, Paul McGrath was the same, wasn't he? He, he was a Gaelic footballer, wasn't he? He didn't play football yeah. until he was about four, 14, or, which was incredible when you and think about it. North Man United played yeah. the guy as well. They played the Gaelic, I played the Hurling. So how old were you when you first kicked a, kicked a ball properly? Probably 17 and 18. I was wow. only playing with Dunleary Celtic two years when I went to Spurs. Blimey. I wasn't playing... And I never played, as I say, from school. I was in the Christian Brothers and their sport was hurling. So you weren't really allowed to play soccer. You couldn't play soccer on a Saturday and hurling on a Sunday. It was one you were punished if you did, you know, the old days. <laughs> <laughs> Have a slap of the leather. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't really, wasn't really interested in football. Did you not used to watch it on the telly? Did you have telly in your day? <laughs> <laughs> there was ten of us. <laughs> I had to ask me far, where did the telly go? <laughs> no, we didn't watch telly. We were out in the street, like playing rounders or curling down the field or soccer in the, in just along the street. Hmm. Till ten o'clock, you got called in. If you went in at half nine, you got a spot in bed because there was nine of us. <laughs> And and were you were you just supporting Manchester United because everyone in Ireland supported Man U? Yeah, you were either Man U or Chelsea back in them days. Mm. Funny enough, and I used to go over for the Leeds match every year. To either go to we go to Old Trafford and then down to Ellen Road, uh, home and away. That's when I I was working in Lourdes Hospital and I could afford to go. So, so you so you must have had a right. Uh, a right good crack at football early on then to get noticed by Spurs. So you said you played for Dunleary Celtic, so that must have been, you must have had two great seasons to be picked up by a side as we big did. as Spurs. We won, we won two FAI Junior Cups, which is probably the same as the amateur FA Cup in England. There's six, 700 teams in it. We won it twice. And next thing I know, I worked in the, the hospital's only up the road and I loved the job. And, the manager came to me and says, uh, Spurs want you to go over on trial. And I said, well, I want to see if I can get the weekend off. I said, because I'm not just going, leaving my job. And I went and asked 
the head nurse and she said, yeah, I could have the weekend off. And I traveled forward and back for eight weeks. They'd fly me over every weekend, play in the reserves and then fly back, go back to work, fly back over the next weekend. And after eight weeks, I said, I'm not coming anymore. I said, uh, I've had enough. So they said, no, we want to sign you. And I said, well, I'm given two weeks notice and work. And I did my two weeks notice and went back to them. And that Spurs side at the time, that must have been what Steve Perryman was the player of the that era, wasn't it? Was in that team. They signed a dealer and Velia. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, 81, yeah, of course. Yeah. I wish I could send I'd send you a picture. I have a great picture of that team. Yeah, send that over. That'd be great to to see yeah. that. Yeah. I'd send it you're you're on WhatsApp, aren't you? Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Send it over. So so when when you were you were training with Ardiles and Villa? Oh god, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, everybody uh huddled. Uh Neil McNabb was my roommate in Diggs. Yep. Uh God did uh, John Gorman, Steve Perryman. Most of the teams, uh God yeah, there was a great side then, some great players. Ardiles fabulous player. Huddled. Well, yeah. Were you nervous? Going, I mean, just coming from yeah, it must have been a massive thing because you'll have seen, you know, you'll have known that they played in the World Cup and everything. Was it was it quite overawing coming over from Ireland as a young lad playing with them? It, it was because, and no matter what they say, you do get homesick. Hmm. There's there's no two ways about it. You, you miss home, but I had lovely digs, and they were nice people. So, and then Neil McNabb moved in. And sort of that eased it because you weren't your own. You had another mad lad that was able to go out with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was a good two years. It was a learning curve for me. I, I, I actually think I think I fucked up really because I was homesick and I never really drank when I was here. And then I went out for a few beers and I sort of lost a bit of I don't know as if it wasn't for me but that I wanted to come home and Keith Buckingham pulled me in. I was going to make my debut against Millwall because Spurs got relegated that year. Mm-hmm. They were relegated and um, he said, you're going to make a debut at Millwall. So I texted, well, I rang the family and my father was coming over, my eldest brother. And then I got injured in training. We were going to play them on the bank holiday Monday at Stephen's Day. Is it Stephen's Day? And I got injured and they sent me home uh, for a week to recover. And I sort of lost interest in it then. And I just wanted to be back at home. And that was my plan. And Keith said he was going to let me go at the end of the year. And I said, that's grand. I'll just come back home. and uh, Home Farm, which was a League of Ireland club, wanted to sign me before I came to Spurs. And I said, well, I'll just go back and play League of Ireland or I'll play with Dunleary Celtic. And uh, Phil Holder was at the being, he was at Spurs and he'd left. And I played against him when he was at Palace in the reserves under George Graham. And me and George Graham had a bit of a to-do. I sort of put him in the stand. <laughs> and then Phil had to go with me and I put him in the stand. And then Alex Stock rang me and said, Phil Holder said, that uh, he'd signed for Bournemouth and he, Alex was looking for players and Phil recommended me to go there. Ah. So it was mad. And I just said, will I or won't I? And I got talking to Alex Stock and he persuaded me to sign for Bournemouth. And, then, and that brought you down? I would have never left and went to Sheffield United. Hmm. But the circumstances of... And I, I should get this across because... Harry was the coach and didn't want me to go. But, I mean, I'd had, I was like second joint leading scorer from my back two seasons running. Mm. And it was, uh, they offered me a three-year contract. And I had to look at it. In them days, you, you, you just, they gave you the contract and they say, take a home, read it out. You didn't have an agent and, all this type of shite, and I, I read it, and I, they offered me nine quid a week rise. 
<laughs> and I went, no, give me a sign in Anfield. Give me something like, like, what's it going to cost to replace me? I said, I, like, joined second leading scorer from right back two seasons. Mm. Played a hundred, I think, consecutive games, and I got I was offered nine quid, and uh, I was just very upset. And I said, "Well, fuck, stick it up your ass." <laughs> Virtually, yeah. fair play. Well, we'll, um, we'll come back. We'll come back and yeah. talk about that Sheffield United move in a minute. But when you when you first came down, what was your impressions of the of the town and the squad? Where did you where did you live? How did you find did you find? I stayed in a hotel just off the station. There, I can't remember the name of the road. You know the park in the middle of Boscombe? Yeah, yeah. Directly across the road, up around the back there, we stayed in a hotel. And uh, till they found his digs, and we went into digs. And it, that, that's the way it was. But my impression of Bourne was good. I, I liked the place. To, it's a fabulous place to live, mm. as I say. And I, I came... Like I came home for the summer and I went back and I don't know if it's a common thing with all the English players or English lads, but I fucking got changed and I had tan like a bottle of milk. <laughs> <laughs> the lad says, that's a fucking nightclub tan you have there. Because <laughs> I wasn't a sunbather, because I born, I go like a tomato and they're all bronze and I'm going, Okay, look at the state of the I see on the toys, then I start sunbathing in the back garden <laughs> to get a bit of a colour. No, it was great, and the lads were great. It was a, there was always a good atmosphere then because you had a supporters club, and win, lose, or draw, I went in there. And if you played bad, you were told. And if you had a good game, they told you. And you had a point with them. And I think that's why I, I get on with the supporters because, to me, not today. They, they, I don't think the players cared about them much because they were paying their wages. Mm. Yeah. And today, but, it's changed dramatically. They, mm. they don't get involved, which I think is wrong. Now, in that first season, Tommy, Ian Cunningham played right back for most of that season, didn't he? What, what was your role in the team? I played centre half. I think Alec had me playing centre half or midfield. Jock was there. I still keep in touch with Jock. Um, yeah, it, Alex was funny. <laughs> like he chopped and changed, and uh, like he got an envelope at the start of the season. When you think, well, it must be a hundred quid in this or something for a fucking drink. <laughs> and it was there. Uh, I want you to score twelve goals. <laughs> on, I don't play up front. I'm fucking playing centre half. Right back on the and it's it there. Uh, I expect you to get 12 goals from your position this year. Bloody hell. Great time. I wonder what the centre forward got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Andy Crawford might have got him because he never fucking passed. <laughs> maybe, maybe, that, maybe that was what was in his envelope. You need to pass the ball 10 times a season. <laughs> that could have been in his. Yeah. But it wasn't in ours. <laughs> Oh uh, boy! Back in eighty two, eighty three, I got to have six months newer. You did, yeah. You did. We got that as a question, I think, coming up. Yeah. Uh, I've in, in that in that side, you played along some great players because that was Ted McDougall was in that side in that seventy nine eighty season, wasn't it? It was his last season with the club. What was that like? Well, Ted was one of these um, being there, seeing it done. It, if you know what I mean, in a nice way. He, he was a nice man. And in training, he was a nightmare. Uh, like, if he passed the ball and went right or left of him, he'd go, I want it to my feet. And I passed the ball to him, and he just let it go past him. He says, I want it in here, in here. And I went, just put your foot out and fucking control it. Now. <laughs> and he went, no, I want it here. I said, I suppose, look, you're over the fucking hill now. <laughs> and he said, uh, "You're right, son." But he said, "You haven't been fucking up it." <laughs> <laughs> and he walked off crying. <laughs> and I went, "No answer to that, is there?" <laughs> now, two uh, laps, I was told, giving out to Ted. Oh, uh, God, but you know, you, you, as you say, with some good players, and 
Don Givens came, didn't he? He was a Irish legend. He came and he scored a hat trick, didn't he? I think he had a short spell at the club. Was that nice having another? Debut, I think he scored a hat trick, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. That yeah, must have been nice. Yeah. Nice for you having another another Irishman like, in the team. Like the likes of them, yeah. But they they only came and went. If you know what I mean, they weren't. Yeah. You didn't get to know them. No. Yeah. If you know what I mean, like when George Best came or Charlie George came, and Brian Kelly, like you didn't get. To know them, they were sort of in do a bit of training. I think they were half injured then, or just taking mm. it easy and play because they were class players. Yeah, like they were like I suppose when I came to the end of my career, you read the game better. Yeah, and you sort of you do less running. Yeah, and, and that's what happens. And it was that season, Tommy, where we went to Tranmere and beat them five nil, and Kenny Allen got attacked by a pensioner. Were you in that game? I was. I gave him the stick. <laughs> <laughs> he jumped out from behind the goal and started hitting him. Oh, God, it was amazing. I, I, I can remember Kenny getting beat, but I didn't remember the score in the game. But I remember yeah. it now when you say it, yeah. yeah it was I think they gave him a season funny. ticket for life after that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. It was when uh, a bit later on David Webb took over, and that was kind of the start, really, of the journey to more success. Could you remember him coming in, and what was he like when he first arrived? Dave was a typical uh, Londoner, you know what I mean? Uh, fucking lovely, jabbly, and all that. He was a bit like <laughs> Harry. And uh, but if it was on his mind, he said it to you. He pulled you in, and he told you exactly where you were and where you stood, and there was no wit, buts, and ands, and to respect that because he great man management skills, like Harry. Like mm. Harry has great man management skills. That's why he gets on with everybody and he treats them. You want to be treated the way you're going to treat somebody else if you're the manager or the coach or mm. you know what I mean. And and once you, you have that rapport, players go out and kill for you. Mm. And they give 100%. And that's what happened with Dave. He got on with everybody. He trained with us. He got stuck in. We used to have a North East South on a Friday on the all weather pitch. Mm. There was more rows. I knocked Trevor Morgan out in one of them. Mm. Afterwards, he had a go at me, and I said, Bring it on, son. And I went to kick him in the nuts, and he bent down and I just uppercut him. <laughs> Were you North or South? Were you North or South? When I say the tackles that went in them games, was frightening. Bloody I was south. You see, I was going to say, Kenny difficult for you to work out. out. Remember Kenny had the pimple on his head? He had a sort of a thing on his head. Yeah. He was, you know, I can't know what we used to call him, but if you chipped him in the game or in, in training, he fucking, that used to pop out and he'd be chasing all over the place because he was six foot four and he was get, getting chipped. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fantastic. Where so, go? But now, them all weather pitch matches on a Friday. Oh my God! Yeah. Fabulous. They were better than the games on a Saturday. Well, on, on the Saturday, that 80, 81, 82 promotion season, you were talking about some of the players before we came on air. I mean, what, what, what sort of? A, how would you describe that team? Well, I'm looking at it now. I don't. Know if you can see it. Like, yeah. I I can go through it like. Ian Lee was the goalie, wasn't he? Ian Lee took over from. Uh, Kenny Allen because he, he broke his broke his wrist I think. Kenny broke his wrist and Ian Lee took over. He had Chris Sully left back, great great left foot, great control, great Spackman. Nigel Spackman. He ended up. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and when he was under, um, who was it? He hardly ever got a game when he was when he when he first came, and I think they were brought him out of his shell and then Harry brought him out of his shell you, you, John Impey who was my roommate, he was the club captain and great centre half, go through brick walls for you, Phil Bricknell signed from West Ham uh, Steve Carter, great right winger Keith Williams, we used to call him the scissors because of his tackles <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trevor Morgan up front right Big centre, big centre forward, give you everything. Tony Funnel, 
very quick. He used to hate marking him in training. Them small fellas, you can't fucking catch them. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy Crawford, he used to love kicking him. He, we went on tour after that, but we'll talk about that later. But yeah. we, we, we had a great side, and everybody kept for everybody. And you had Milton Graham there uh, coming through, Derek Dawkins, you know. Yeah, what's his name? Doesn't matter as a fucking brush. He's not in the side there. He signed him. Was he at Swindon? Remember, he broke his leg at Swindon. He was. Oh, get him. He broke his leg at Swindon. He was the next best thing as a centre forward. And then he broke his leg at Swindon. And he signed for, for Bournemouth. Oh, he was a Luba. I tell you. Who was that? Was. I'm going to tell you now. Uh, Howard Goddard. Oh, oh yeah, 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 Pissing in and being up the front, no <laughs> toilets, nothing, and that's how it was. And you were up back on the same day. There was no toilet, so you had to piss in a bin at, at the front of the coach. Yeah, and the fucking coach driver looking at because he gay. <laughs> you were trying to have a piss. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, God, there was a bin down the steps, and you'd be, we used to stop and get a few beers in the off license and get a chipper. And then we'd be down the back playing cards, having a smoke, a cigar going. And then you had to go down and like piss next to the driver. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. So, so tell us about the tour then, because we've done the season. What was the what was the tour like at the end? The tour was a great tour. You think about this, like we just played forty, I think I played fifty odd games that year with cups and everything else. And we went on tour, nine games we had. In Jesus. New Zealand, one in Australia and eight in New Zealand, traveling around the North Island, Wanganui, uh, Gisborne. Wow. And, and when I say back in them days, like you had to wind the bus up to get it going. <laughs> like New Zealand then, the cars was like going back to Cuba, 19 fucking 20s, an old school bus traveling around. The scenery was great. Unbelievable. Hotels, all all the hotels were on one level, so it was like just crazy. And maybe putting the curfew, well, lads. Uh, we arrived uh, in Auckland, and like it was twenty six hours. I think we travelled, and we got there, and it took us for a three mile road run, and then back to the hotel, falling asleep in our dinner. And playing the next day, and after twenty minutes we were two 0 down, and he's gone mad. Like <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I came back. I scored two. Uh, we won four two. I got man in the match, and I got a pair of trainers that were probably nineteen fucking twenties. Who fucking size them? You wouldn't wear them gardening. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that that was a great trip. You see, he actually that year. Um, we played in a game and John Impey wasn't playing to, and I was captain. And they weren't easy games because like New Zealand were coming into football then. Yeah. And, uh, Andy Crawford. There we go. Wouldn't pass the ball, wouldn't do this. I wasn't giving out to him and he just said, fuck off, you know, with the usual. And of course I said, well, I'll take your head off now. And I get in the changing room to myself. But Webby attacked him and just had a word with him and told him to get changed he just wasn't going out in the second half then we had a meeting back at the hotel and uh he got him a flight and sent him home and i think he sold him to blackpool yeah he so mm. went for 75 grand mm. uh, he never played him that. Again. he was a really talented player but you're right he just didn't pass enough mm. very frustrating though like I, I i might go and watch there's a friend of mine his daughter his grandchild plays in the girls' team, and what a player! Unbelievable. 
it runs in the family. They're all very good players. And he, he, I didn't know who she was. And he said, what do you think of that little girl over there? And I said, I wouldn't have her on my team. He said, why? She's the best player. And I said, it's seven aside. I said, she won't pass the ball. She keeps losing after beating six players. Why would you have her on the side? He said, that's my granddaughter. I said, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have her in my team. <laughs> you, have to, you have to have players that, you know, you can't have individuals. You have individuals, but mm. it's a team game. And mm. we were a team then, which was brilliant. And we were a team under Harry as well in 87 when we won, you know. Mm. There's yeah. the program now, yeah. But those those were the days. Those were when you played football for a living, if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah. If you weren't, you, that, that was a job. Yeah. Yeah, it's true and true. There was no like fucking. Like, I would. I don't even have a car now. I can't afford a car now. I'm on disability because I have new hip and my knee went, and that's all football. And just can't afford a car. It's fucking crazy. And they're parking Rolls Royces in the fucking thing, and if, if you touch off the telly, they fall over. <laughs> they do. You know what I mean? they do. Talking yeah. about. Talking about that, Tommy, there was a loads of hard players around in the early 80s. You've, you've talked about being quite a hard player yourself, which you were. Who was the hardest opponent you came up with physic against physically? Did you have any massive battles with people? Um, I looked in the mirror once and that was probably the hardest <laughs> man I came up against. <laughs> no. Um, I suppose Big Billy uh, of Bradford. Billy Whitehurst? Yeah. Hmm. He broke my nose in that game. In the Bradford game, that two-two draw. Yeah. yeah, he straightened it. Look, he used to be over there. Like, <laughs> he used to be like Steve Bruce's. Yeah, and he came across and elbowed me, and I broke his wrist in that game. How did you and break his him. wrist? He used to run across you. You know, he'd start on the outside and he'd come in. To head the ball, but he'd leave his elbow in your face. Like I wasn't born this ugly. <laughs> and I seen him coming. I took three steps back. I knew he was going to miss it, and it just dropped. And I just followed it straight back at him as hard as I could. And he put his hand up and broke his wrist. Yeah. And we we stood at the bar afterwards, and he says, "You broke my wrist." And I said, "Well, you broke my nose." <laughs> and I, he said, "We're quits." And he was going to the hospital. Having a point before he went, mad as he, a bush. He used to he used to do bare knuckle boxing um, in the summer. Um, he used yeah. to do he used to do fairground bare knuckle boxing in the summer, Billy Whitehouse. And I, I don't think there's anything harder than doing bare knuckle boxing in the fairground. And I think that says a lot about him, doesn't it? Oh well, it does. Yeah, I think he mm. practiced on my face. Look, <laughs> but a good yeah. footballer as well. He was. Footballer as well. He was. <clears throat> So you you talked about uh, becoming captain, Tommy. Did you see yourself as a natural leader in that side? I, I think in that side, we had we were all captains. You get me? It wasn't like because I was captain, I took advantage of that fact. The fact was we, we treated everybody the same. You, you were a leader. It was a name to us. It was, it was a privilege, but to me, every one of us, like players had goals with each other, and we all clicked. There was no coming in and arguing at half time. And you spoke to me, and you did this, and you know what I mean. That that was the best thing about Dave Webb. That that's and Harry. Like maybe you'd have a go at me at half time and say, like we were winning one 0 I think we we're beating Hull, and they came in, and it was digging me out, and I'm going, okay, I'll say nothing. And after the game, I knocked on his door and I went in. So what the fuck was all that? He said, well. There's fucking what's his name over in the corner. I can't think of who it was. He said, if I had a go with him, I might as well take him off. I know I can have a go with you. And the lads will say, well, he's well, winning one nil. He's had the score and, and Dave Webb's having a go with him. So we must be doing all right. <laughs> Reverse psychology. Never worked on my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean? Like, but there was no argument and there was great... Like going away on the coaches, playing cards with Harry and smoking a cigar, and like 
that's the way it was in them days. We used to smoke King Edwards, mm. travelling up on the coach and on the <laughs> way back. Myself, John Smolis, and that when he was there, God, it's games of cards, brilliant. You imagine it now. I know. One of the one of the things that stands out about you, Tommy, was your goal scoring records. Uh, you mentioned it earlier on. You sc you scored uh, seventeen goals in two seasons, which for a right back is an incredible whack, including a hat trick against Millwall. Um, what 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 did you put that down to? I know you took a few penalties, but a lot of those weren't penalties because I remember them. But was it just you were just given free license? Yeah, I'd I'd like to score, hmm. and then so I wanted to score in every game. I mean, if you look overall, I played 317 games and I scored 33 goals. That's a goal every nine games. Mm. So that's not bad for a right back. Might be worth me weight in goal today. Can you imagine that book? <laughs> yeah. But yes, no, I mean, it was just down to being there at the right time. You know what I mean? It's like a good centre forward. Might not do well, but he scored you two or three and he hasn't broken sweat. I was the maybe just lucky. The hat trick must have felt great because it's un really unusual to get a hat trick for a fullback. It did. It was a. I remember it well. It was a header, a volley, and a penalty. Mm. Scored two in the first half, one in the second half. And <laughs> I'll tell you what happened there. I got the ball signed by both sides, uh, varnished it, brought it home, gave it to my dad, and uh, he had it up. And next to because I. I I captained the Irish amateur side, so I had a jersey, and that was up there. And uh, I come home one day, and I'd three brothers, and the two youngest are playing football in the garden. Oh, well, that's great! We used to do that. We were playing with the hat trick ball, <laughs> <laughs> kicking all the names up. Like, fucking hell! And then I, I, I said, I went into the house, said, "Like, what are they doing? The ball's ruined." And I said, "Where's my jersey going?" Oh, there was a girl dying of cancer and uh, round the corner, so we, we auctioned that off in the local pub. She fucking up to me short off as well. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Really? But, like, and, and then um, and then what what did you make of George Best coming? Was that was that a surprise as well to the to the side? When George Best turned up, the, the best the best team we've got um was Nobody really cared. We were all interested in Mary Stavon. She was gorgeous. Look, Maggie and Train, and we go, I don't care, George. I'm looking at your fucking look. Don't mind me all you like. <laughs> he was the same. He's going up for train and then go back to the hotel, and you're never seeing him. And like he was there, and he was, I think he was on three grand a week, two and a half grand a week. Mm. For, for matches because he packed out every game yeah and then he started not turning up and he went back to London and Brian Tyler chased him down and found him and but it, it, like he was just come in train excellent player excellent even then you'd have played behind him wouldn't you because was he right wing and yeah. you were right back so who, who was, was right back who was covering who's running <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do much covering. <laughs> but you could see the class was still there. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that never went for, from him. He, he was he was world class. One of the, probably the best one of the with him, well, you have Ronaldo now, I think he's more into his makeup now than fucker and football. Yeah. One of the, the top three players ever. Mm. No, he was. I totally I, agree with that. I can and remember you know, it was silly. We never asked him for his autograph or sign your shirt. And when you go, well, I'll take that. He mm. didn't do them things. Like I, some of the players, like I got the 1966 World Cup winning sides, all graphs at the PFA do. And I came back to Bournemouth and a friend of mine, Eddie Lamb, I don't know any of you knew him. He had a clothes shop in uh, Charminster uh, facing the pub. And I gave it to him. Imagine what that's worth now. Yeah. And he, he worked for TVS and he collected autographs and uh, his son robbed them all and sold them. And they, they, were like, they were just players to me. Everybody was just sort of... 
you didn't treat them any different than they would treat you, I suppose. Yeah, yeah when you were on the, when you're on the pitch, know me, I knew them. <laughs> yeah, when you're on the pitch, you're all the same, I guess. I, I can remember George Best playing some tremendous crossfield passes, and the other whoever was on the other side hadn't made the run because they just weren't <laughs> on the same wavelength as him. That's and, what I'm saying. He was yeah. still, he still had that gift of, yeah, you know what I mean. He did, we played south down the way. And he did that. And I, I was running. I thought he was going to... And he, he stepped over it and I kept going. And I lobbed the keeper. It was in the summer. And I went, there we go. I turned. I thought it was in the net. And it bounced. I went over the bar. But the dummies just <laughs> left the defence stood. But I kept going. And mm. the keeper came out and I flicked it over. Well, I didn't flick it. I hit him a good bit out. And bounced and straight over him. Over the bar. But that's how quick the mind for him. Like somebody else probably would have controlled it. Mm. You, you don't know. So, so you, you talked about the move up to Sheffield United and how that came about. I mean, you must have been you must have been a bit sick to leave, weren't you? I was, yeah. Like, if you look at what I'd done and what they offered me, nine quid, like, it was an insult, really. And uh, Phil Brickner was let go that year. And he was on the phone because he had no agents then. So if you wanted to get, get another club yourself, you rang and said, look, I'm Joe Bloggs from Bournemouth. They're letting me go. Do you need a centre-half, a right-back, centre-forward, whatever. And he rang uh, Ian Porterfield, Lord of Mercy, on him, and asked him if he was looking for a centre-half. And uh, he said, no, but I'm interested in Tommy Heffernan. And Phil said, no, he's had to sign a three-year contract. Now I can understand he's probably trying to get himself in and mm. give a media elbow, but he told a friend and a friend told me, and I rang in Porterfield, I said, look, I hear you're interested in signing me. He said, no, you've signed a three-year contract. And I said, well, no, I haven't. And he said, okay, uh, leave it with me. And he rang the club and they wanted 85 grand for me. And I went in, seeing Harry and Brian Tyler, and I went, has anybody been in for me? And they said, no. I said, well, I've just been on the phone to Ian Porterfield. I said, and you want 85 grand for me? I said, I'll see you at the tribunal. I'm taking you to a tribunal. And uh, they must have they discussed it with Ian Porterfield again. And Porterfield rang me back and said, we've agreed a price. Get the train up tomorrow. And that's the way it happened. Mm. You had a great time up there, didn't you? I've got a friend who's a Sheffield United fan who remembers you very fondly. You became a bit of a cult hero and you had a promotion, didn't you? What was it like? Bigger crowds? You must have loved it. Bigger crowds? Like, we were averaging between probably 18 and 20-odd when the games were big. They're different. They're like, you're going from... Here I am, look, over in the left. What a man, though. Ian Porterfield. Great manager again. Man management skills. But... It, it's it's a premiership club mm. and back then it was probably a first division club it's Sheffield Wednesday but fanatical fans I mean it's chalk and cheese with Bournemouth Bournemouth are lovely people they're fanatics up mm. there and, and that's the difference and yeah we got promotion um, we got promotion with Burnley only drew at home nil nil and we went up by one goal difference, mm. which was brilliant. And then went off on tour to uh, the US of A, Hong Kong, China, Malaysia, uh, yeah. Japan. And Phil Thompson was on loan to us from Liverpool then. Oh, God, yeah, with the nose. I played 100 games for them. Mm. So, yeah, great time, great place, great people. So, so why did you move back to Bournemouth? Harry. I was. We went on tour to America, and I played right back there, and I was leading scorer from right back. Gordon Jago was uh, managing Dallas Sidekicks, and he asked me to stay out there and play in Doha, and he offered me a very good contract. And um, Harry rang me, and he was after having a spell in America, and he said. I want you to sign for Bournemouth. So I went back to Bournemouth and signed for Harry. So, 
That was it. I could have went to America and made tons of money, but I did. I went back and played with Bournemouth. Could you see in Harry Redknapp that he the career that he went on to have managing Tottenham and everything? Could you see that in the early days? Was he special? Do you ever watch Only Fields and Horses? Yeah, never miss it. Yeah, fucking. Uh, what's Harry's nickname? Del Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Harry was always going to be, always going to be there. But you don't go that far not being a bad manager. Being a bad manager. You know mm. what I mean? And he, he picked some, he picked players that were near the end of his contract and he gave them a second chance. And when you give somebody a second chance, they're going to fight tooth and nail for you. Mm. And look at the job he did at Portsmouth and won the FA Cup, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And the, the amount of players that were on their last legs. So that that's the type of man he was. And <laughs> if he hadn't the fiddle, the book is out a million. No, I can't say that. <laughs> You'd have probably got the, the England job. Mm. How, mu how much fun was it to be part of that championship uh, winning side? That must have been such a laugh, wasn't it? It was brilliant. The same again. Like We used to all meet up and, and, and do things together that players don't do now. They just come and they disappear. Like I've been to the ground a couple of times. And when we had our 30-year anniversary... I was very surprised that Eddie Howe never turned up on the Friday night for our dinner or the players didn't come in on the Saturday after to sort of mingle and say, geez, you, mm. we were the first team to win the, the championship. Mm. And they never came and they were gone. And I thought that was very sad. Mm. You know what I mean? Not to be involved with the, the team that's done it and set mm. the club on its way just to, to come and play the game and disappeared. And it's like if you ask them for their autographs, it's like asking for fucking 20 quid or something, you think. Mm. Like, I've, I've, to be honest, I've no time for them. Mm. I, I don't, uh, when, when they're like that. If anybody ever spoke to me, I gave them time and I stopped and I chat and I I go and do deals. Like, all they're interested in now, I think, is, like, what's his name is looking at leaving and going to Spurs. Uh, Ryan Fraser. Did you see him? I'd, I'd go training and I'd break both his legs. You don't <laughs> leave the club until you play the season out. I know mm. it, it's delayed and your contract's up in June, but you signed a contract to play mm. until the season. Oh, well, I might get injured and I won't go to Spurs. You're not going either way. Because I would. I'd do him in training. Mm. <laughs> Show some respect to the fans for, for and the club and say, right, I'll play the season now and then I'm gone on a free mm. transfer. Don't need now. That, that's, to me, is... I've, I, I'd just... I'd kill him. <laughs> I would, I swear to God. Who were the best... Uh, who were your best friends in that squad? Who did you used to go out drinking with? Was it Willow and... Was there, or God, we never went drinking. <laughs> you not? Know? No. Um, John Hippie was my real mate. Or, you mean, in 87... Yeah. yeah, 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 that's got yeah, yeah. We've had we've had Willow and, and Paul Morell on, and they both said you had a, a there was a, a great spirit of going out together. Yeah, it was vodka. <laughs> <laughs> we did, but that's what I'm saying. We'd hook up one night a week, um, we we jailed, we went out together. We we'd get weighed on a Friday morning, and if you were overweight, you paid a five or a pound, and then you went to McDonald's after training. <laughs> We used to go into Queen's Park Golf Club into the sauna and jog in a plastic bag before we get weighed in mm. and go training them. And because we were a fiver, it was like a fiver was <laughs> to us. We weren't earning. Yeah. You know what I mean? When I signed for Bournemouth, it was on 80 quid a week. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, when lads kicked the waiters, that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we. We enjoyed ourselves. I won't say too much because what happens at home stays at home. But we, we, we enjoyed ourselves. But we also fought hard for each other. Mm. And that showed on the pitch. So nobody can take that away with us. It wasn't like, oh, we're seeing them down the pub fucking Friday night and they're playing the Saturday. So yeah, there, was, there was a story that uh, when we went to play Middlesbrough at uh, Ayrson Park, uh, two nil down at half time, you grabbed their manager Bruce Riot by the throat. What was that all about? He, he had to go with one of the players on the way in. He was digging there. I can't remember who it was, and I just grabbed him and fucked him through the doors. And 
there was three or four fellas hanging out me, stopped me punching his eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> he came and apologised after the match, so I must have been right. <laughs> <laughs> he did, he came and apologised, but I had him. <laughs> In the weight room we ended. Heat of the moment, heat of the moment stuff, wasn't it? The, uh, you, you, played, you played a big part in that championship season, more than I remember, actually, because I was looking back. You had, you had that, that spell where we won an awful lot of games over Christmas. I think Martin Houston went back up front. You came back in at right back, didn't you? Yeah. Did you? Were you disappointed you didn't play more or did you, or did you just see no, that was the way that... You were part of the team going for the championship and, like, you, you play your best squad. Hmm. You know what I mean? And, and that's how it is. You're part of a squad and... If you're not playing, you're still part of the squad. You still have a say in the changing room. You can win a half time and you try and book the lads up. And that's what I used to do and cheer them on and boost them up and go out and play better in the second half. Sometimes Harry never said a word. We played right. swinging away. He didn't need to do the talk. I'd done the talk. And that's how it worked in them days. Not good. Now they have to bring in a packet of fucking hankies in case you upset them. <laughs> Harry said that you were so hard you used to head cricket balls. Did you? Yeah, but I got paid for it. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right then. There was no money in them days, so I used to say, well, I've had the cricket ball the length of the changing room where everybody puts a few balls in the middle of the table. <laughs> and they'd throw it at me and I'd head it. It's never affected me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. The... Um... At the end of that, at the end of that season, we've had a few of the players on, and they remember the trip to Portugal very well. Did did you do you remember the trip to Portugal? <laughs> Vaguely, but it depends what they told you. <laughs> well, we've had also we've had uh, I think Mark O'Connor and Tony Pulis falling out with everyone. We've had a few bits. What 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 do you remember? You must have one funny story. I can't I can't tell you because it was. I'd get a lot of people in trouble. We sort of had a. a I suppose I better tell you. No, we sort of had a run and battle with the locals. So I'll say no more. <laughs> <laughs> who, came right. who came who won? Who won? The locals or what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won. <laughs> oh, boy. So no, the course of the trip was great, but everybody remembers Tony Pulis and Mark O'Connor. My wife was pregnant at the time. So with our first child and going in and having a test, but everybody remembers that because they never spoke to anybody afterwards. And it's like when Tony was made coach. Like I understand you have to change, but his first day he came in and Harry just said, Well, Tony's my new coach. And we went, Where's that come from? And we got out on the pitch and he said, Well, I want three we want you to do three laps. And we all just turned and said, Fuck off. You've only just taken over and you think like you're gonna make us run the, the ass office. Fuck off. Did you did you see him becoming a good manager? Um, I don't know. It, to be honest, I wouldn't say he got on with the players. Hmm. His man management skills Yeah you are Tony. Hmm. To me I don't think he had the uh, personality. And I still don't think he has. I've seen a few interviews and it's, I'd say he crucified the players. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've never spoke to anybody that's been under his management to find out, mm. to be honest. But to me, playing with him and the way he behaved, like he never mixed with the players. Him or Mark O'Connor, he went on to, to coach for him and be his right hand man. They were always individuals. Mm. And never mixed with us. They never came out with the lads and anything else. So they, they were sort of two lads on their own, if you know what I mean. And I was, when did... I was looking back at that season, I just it, it was interesting because you scored in that season. Tony Pulis was the only outfield player not to score in that promotion season because you scored away at Gillingham when you came back in. Uh, so yeah. it's interesting. Every single member of the squad scored apart from Tony Pulis. He was never a goal scorer, though, because he was never... His job was to win the ball in midfield. Mm. He was a bit like Keith Williams. Great tackler, but he wasn't a, an attacking midfielder. He'd sort of just between there. He'd never 
you'd never seen him going a 20, 30 yard run to break the defence down and try and make space for himself to score. No, he protected the back no. four, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. Sorry, Jeff, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say, how did you celebrate winning promotion that season? Can you remember any of it? Um, what did we do? Well, it happened at Fulham. We all got the coach. We bought the club out of champagne. The, all the wives and girlfriends had come up, so they came back on the coach with us. And uh, just had the, the best time ever. Sunday was a blank. I think Monday was a blank. It was, it was just a brilliant day. If the wives and girlfriends were on the coach, there was no bin by the driver. <laughs> you had a toilet then. We moved on. We moved on. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was just as well. You know what I mean? Otherwise, I'd have been a very busy man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Do, do, and then, uh, how did retirement come? Was it injury? Uh, no, did, no. No, no, no. Uh, just... Just I finished playing with I played I played till I was forty six. I came back to Ireland and played amateur here. Right. And I played for Pool Town and Poppies and Swanage Town and that over in Storminster Marshall. And just came back here and a fella said to me, I hear you used to play in England. He says, We need to win our next five games not to get relegated. Would you play for us? And he said, Jay, he said, we're training on Thursday. I said, no, I don't do that anymore. I'm mm -hmm. up on Sunday. Pick me up. And uh, St. Joseph's boys it was. And I'll never forget it because I got my boots out. And I, I went into the change room and I could hear them saying, who's the old man in the corner? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I got out on the pitch and I spun a few 50 yarders and 40 yarders. And they were going, where the fuck did you get him from? <laughs> And we won the five games, and they never got. I played with them for another season after that. Brilliant. Were you still at right, still at right back, or were you up front, or where did you play? Centre half. Centre half. Yeah. Tommy, when you took penalties, do you do you ever remember placing one? Because Neil and I can't remember that you ever did. I always put them in the left hand side, the keeper in the side netting. The one against Hull, I miss hit, but I always put them to the keeper's right. Yeah, but they went like a bullet, didn't they? You didn't, you didn't try yeah. for them. Yeah, the, the one thing you do is don't change your mind. Mm. It, it's just, you just pick a spot because I wanted to take them. People, some people are you see, and they're going up and they think he's going to miss when you see them on the telly. You know they're going to miss because you have to want. To, give me the ball, I'm taking the penalty. Fuck off. That is me. When you when you watch the side now on telly, who um, I mean, it's obviously it's a, such a different I world for jump all of us. The fence and kick every one of them up the yeah. ass and say, "My God!" <laughs> like if you fall over again without getting touched. <laughs> who do you think? So, who, who stands out for you? Who do you like watching? I don't like watching any of them at the moment. Um, I've, I've watched a lot of football on the telly, but you, it's, you don't have the same interest now. It's mm. not like you're, you're glued to the telly. You're just like you're having a conversation. Like I'd come to the pub on a Sunday afternoon and meet all the lads. Well, we're all old men now. But you do more talking than watching now mm. because of yeah. the, the way the game is played. Yeah. The, the rules. Oh. It, there's no getting stuck in and it's Liverpool and it's all football. I went to watch Spores and Top Spores and Bournemouth this season. At the new ground, yeah, and I wanted to run down, jump over, and kick somebody and go. <laughs> and you know what? It cost me seventy-five quid to get in. Blimey. I didn't even get a, a, a complimentary ticket. So Bournemouth owed me seventy-five quid, and I paid <laughs> me door. It cost me two hundred and ten quid for tickets. I have uh -huh. to, I have to go out my way to get a ticket for Bournemouth mm. if I come we over. We've heard a lot of that. We've heard a lot of that from the uh, some of the older players saying that they just can't get in. It's it's quite disappointing, really. I guess that the club doesn't do I a do little bit more. With, like, I played. I've won two promotions for the club. Mm. I've won two murals, and it's like I'm ringing up begging for a ticket. Mm. I, I, I don't. Not good. Not good. 
one other thing, Tommy, you were you were also a bit of a style icon with that that bubble perm that you had in the eighties. Where did you get your hair done in Bournemouth? I was going out um, to the hairdresser. Okay. And her friend was away on holiday. I'd never met her. You're like, this when I start going out with a girlfriend. And when I make him back, I start going out with her. <laughs> and I made a mistake at going back to get a light perm off the old girlfriend. And she fucking sacked me. And, I, <laughs> and that's the truth. And I ended up marrying Sarah. Her friend. Huh. And we have my beautiful daughter, Zoe. But that's what happened. <laughs> like, I went for a, you know, one of these in fashion light perms. And my hair was all really a little bit curly, but she sapped me. When I say it just was like, oh, that's the truth. Well, Fantastic. Revenge, revenge is a dish best served cold, man. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, but that's the truth. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. Honestly, God. Thanks, thanks so much, Tommy. It's been, it's been a, a wonderful trip down memory lane. I tell you, I've enjoyed it. And anytime you want to be in touch, you, you have my details now. Yeah. Anytime. It's a pleasure. It's well, always nice to do everyone. something for, I hope the supporters see it. Because I love the supporters. Well, did you, did you know that there's a fan who follows you on Twitter, a Bournemouth fan called Tommy Heffernan's Poodle? Is he a twit as well? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but it's been, been great know. having you on. Yeah. <laughs> It's been fantastic. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Guys. Cheers. I Thanks. Hope, I hope it goes well. And, uh, thank you. As I say, anytime.